Welcome back. This lecture continues our discussion of content assessment during a content strategy development project. I'm going to start by describing content accessibility audits. Second, I'll explain the practice of content reuse and how to include it in your assessment. Third, I'll summarize the content qualities I presented in part one and part two on assessing content. And finally, I'll briefly explore what's meant by content management. So first up is describing what it means to audit for content accessibility. Accessibility is in many ways about usability, but focused on specific groups of users with distinct needs. These users have often been ignored when companies publish content. In 1998, the U.S. Congress amended the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 to require federal agencies to make their electronic and information technology accessible to people with disabilities. So federal agencies and contractors that do business with them are required to deliver content that's accessible. For private businesses in the EU, there are specific standards that must be met. For private businesses in the U.S., Rules are a little more complicated. They're not required by law to comply with any specific standards, but their websites are supposed to be accessible. All of that means content strategists may work for clients who have not considered accessibility and its importance during a content audit or assessment. Accessibility involves the content companies deliver to customers at all stages of their journey, as shown on this slide whether that content is delivered on the web, or on the radio or podcast, or in store. If you're learning about customer journeys for the first time, note that the central portion of the diagram shows the stages of a customer's journey with a product. The wavy timeline shows the touch points, usually context in which a company delivers content. These all support a customer moving from one stage of the journey to the next. As an example, after a customer purchases a product, the company uses an FAQ or knowledge base to deliver content about using the product. That's supposed to influence whether they actually retain that customer. So that's enough about customer journeys for our purposes. In your required reading for this module, I asked you to spend 30 minutes reviewing guidelines for writing for web accessibility because so much content is delivered via the web today. Most technical content, which typically means content about products after purchase, is delivered digitally. I've also provided many related resources in the To Learn More section of your instructional materials for this module. For example, there's a source that provides guidance for creating accessible digital products of all kinds, whether that's a spreadsheet or a PDF or something else. I should also mention that you'll also find a source that lists tools for evaluating web accessibility. Some of these may be helpful in your own content strategy project. In the next few minutes, I'm going to provide an overview of the aspects of web accessibility that might be included in a typical web content audit. The Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, referred to as WCAG, define three levels of compliance. A, AA, and AAA. In this lecture, I'll describe only the level A or essential areas of compliance. I'll further limit the areas I talk about by highlighting five areas that you can locate without looking at the code. Of course, I should note that there are a number of HTML and CSS specific rules, like tagging lists or tables with their HTML elements. You'll find other sources that will teach you about these in the To Learn More section on Canvas. As for written text, what WCAG labels content, sites should use plain language and left alignment for left to right languages. For images, there should be alt text that describes the meaning of a chart or a map. That includes any text that's actually located within that image. As for headings, a site should use only one heading level per page and shouldn't skip heading levels. In other words, heading level 3 can be used only if it appears under heading level 2. For color, there should be sufficient contrast between text and icons and the background. For media, 
A site should provide captions for video and transcripts for audio. There should be no media set to autoplay, and all media should permit a user to pause the play. Auditing the five aspects of accessibility I've covered here will enhance the usability of content for all users. Any could be included in your content assessment project. I hope I've made it clear that there's much more to know about accessibility. In part two of the lecture, I'm going to talk about content reuse, which may be a new concept for many of you. You learn more about the technology behind content reuse in TECM 5191. That's the digital literacies course. Before I talk about auditing for content reuse, I need to ensure you understand what reuse means. I'm going to start with three related concepts which build upon each other. I'll give you some definitions and then on the next slide take you through an example. Topic-based authoring is what a content creator does. It means creating content once and saving it as individual topics. Those can also be called things like chunks or components or modules. Each is a single file stored in a database of topic files. That makes the content modular. Content reuse is what a company does with those modular topic files. It means pulling the same topic file out of the database to reuse whenever and wherever that content is needed. Single source or multi-channel or even omni-channel publishing is also what a company does. It means reusing the same topic file, for example, in a blog post on a website, a white paper sent as a PDF via email, and a print brochure handed out at a trade show. There's a single copy of the same content, a single source of truth with zero formatting because format is applied when the topic is used inside a publication. It's different for a PDF as opposed to a blog post. Now, let's see how this would work in practice for Fagor Automation, a company in Spain that sells digital equipment used in factories. They create those print brochures on the front table to hand out at trade shows for each of their 10 different products. They probably have more than that. We'll just assume there's 10. They have to translate each of those 10 into at least 10 different languages because their potential customers have factories across the globe. I'll simplify things by assuming the English language brochure for one product called Quercus includes two different topics and two different images. A topic is a chunk of text. It could be a paragraph or several paragraphs. For Quercus, one topic might be a paragraph describing the benefits of using the product. So if Fagor stores all their topics and images in a database, then they can reuse the two topics and one image in a blog post about Quercus published on their website. And they could reuse one topic and two images in a white paper produced as a PDF in 10 different languages. The exact translated content would appear in all of these publications. All right, so here's how the three concepts work together. A topic is created once, and stored as a single source for reuse as a module in multiple publications or channels for delivering content. I want to show you this graphic again and ask you to think about why an organization like Fagor Automation should care about content reuse. In terms of market attractiveness, what makes them more money, content reuse means more consistency across all channels all publications. One of the most common complaints from customers is they get different information from the same company. With a single source of truth for content, that issue solved. Content reuse also increases competitive advantage, means the company spends less money, all because content reuse enhances efficiency. For instance, new publications are delivered more quickly by pulling existing topic files rather than recreating them. And multiple employees will not be creating the same content over and over. When there's a change in something at the company, revisions are made in only one topic file and then pushed out to all the publications in which that topic appears. Or if a new web design is implemented, the same topic files are used without the need for editing. For translation, there's only one version of content to deal with. This is super important. Fewer words, lower translation costs. 
Remember that a content inventory and audit will only be valuable if results can be used to make a business more profitable. Focusing on content reuse is guaranteed to increase profit. That means auditing for reuse potential adds to the business value of content. So your key question at this point is, how do I know what content has the potential for reuse? The content experts within TechCom have been doing audits to identify content for reuse for a couple of decades now. Those in marketing have only recently become interested in this idea. For this course, I want to give you some practical tips based on what I've learned from folks like Ann Rockley and Charles Cooper, who wrote a book on content strategy and auditing for reuse way back in 2002. I've also learned much from Val Swisher, CEO of a company called Content Rules. One simple way to learn about potential for content reuse is to ask the content creators what they find themselves borrowing. In other words, what do they copy and paste across documents or products? It's typical not to analyze potential of every piece of content for reuse. Rather, the content strategist chooses a sample. You should have spent some time looking at the diagram from content rules in your instructional materials for this module. It shows how they sample during an audit to estimate how much content has reuse potential. So here's an example of how this would work for Fagor. Let's say we pick Quercus from the table shown here, and we look at all of the content for that product the brochures, white papers, online help, etc. We also select a sample of one type from all Fagor's products. Let's say we decide to analyze all of the content in online help for the four products shown in the table. As content rules explained in your reading, product collections provide a snapshot of content reuse across all outputs for a single product. In other words, all publications or channels. Document type collections provide information about one type of output across all products. Let me clarify one thing at this point. During your audit, you do not suggest how to split up existing pieces of content. You know, those individual assets you've created a row for in your spreadsheet. If some portion of that piece of content has potential for reuse, that's all you need to document in your audit. Remember again, inventories and audits are valuable because their findings are later used strategically when designing the future of content. At this point, I want to briefly summarize all the qualities I've talked about that can be valuable to evaluate during a qualitative content audit. In the previous lecture, I mentioned five qualities to use during a qualitative content audit for each piece of content. For example, you rate or categorize the findability of each piece of content in your spreadsheet. You might also rate or categorize accessibility as a special form of usability using descriptive categories or numbers. And you might rate or categorize the reuse potential of each piece of content to increase its business value. We've now completed the instructional material that I'll cover to support your assessment work in the course. I'm excited to see how you put this knowledge into action in your content strategy project. Before I end this lecture, I want to very briefly explore what content strategists within technical communication mean by content management. It's a term you're bound to hear about the technology used to manage content. I'll begin by showing you the results from a survey conducted by CIDM. That's the Center for Information Development Management. The graph displays the authoring tools that TechCom Pros said they were using in 2016. For our purposes, I want you to notice that the most commonly used primary tools, the ones in green, Ditta, Flare, some versions of FrameMaker, all support topic-based or modular content. That means they allow companies to reuse content. This is why TECM 5191 teaches you about HTML, Ditta, and Flare. There are many, many more authoring tools used in industry, so there's no way and no reason to learn them all. If you can use one, you'll figure out pretty quickly how to use any of the others. My point here is that digital authoring tools are part of a larger information system designed to manage content within a company. I'm sure your content strategy project has been showing you why managing content is both important 
and complicated. Let me clarify a little about those information systems by categorizing them into three types. Enterprise content management systems are tools that organizations use to share all types of information, usually internally within a company. Two of the most widely used are Adobe Experience Manager, or AEM, and Microsoft SharePoint. Content management systems are a little more specialized. They're used to publish content on the web. The two most widely used are WordPress and Drupal. Component content management systems are highly specialized. They're used to publish modular content or components. Most like XML doc for AEM or Easy Ditta, published by implementing Ditta standards for modular content. Ditta stands for Darwin Information Typing Architecture. Flare is unique in that it supports modular content, but not really DITA standards. You'll learn more about all of this in TECM 5191. Keith Gilly Roberts published an interesting piece on the job market for tech writers in 2019. His conclusion from tracking jobs in Indeed was that although it appears there are fewer jobs each year, it's actually the titles of the jobs that are changing. Many of these now include the term content and highlight the ability to manage modular or topic-based content. Here's what you should remember. Only a CCMS can manage topic-based or modular content. It's important that you learn what type of authoring and content management tools a company is currently using as you begin thinking about how they can be more strategic with their content. That's enough for now. Much more strategy coming in the final weeks of the course. <music>